Good morning, everybody. And I say that because I am quite literally in my pajamas. <laughs> I figured this would be a fun video to just kind of like keep a casual as I ease into my Monday morning. And we're gonna answer some questions. So yesterday I went on Instagram and on my YouTube community tab and I asked you to ask me anything. Most of the questions were somewhat fitness related, maybe nutrition related. And then I did get some like personal and business questions. I'm gonna save that as like the fun stuff at the end. I try to get as many things in here as possible, but I also don't want this to be like an hour long video. So we're doing our best here. I'm gonna try and keep these answers as succinct as possible. Let's start with the fitness questions. Recommendations for workout clothes, especially shoes. I'm a little big, so I prefer baggy clothes, but my normal sweatpants just make me overheat, so I've resorted to just working out my boxers in my room. If I'm being honest, I am not really like in the fitness influencer type of thing, so I am not super aware of different brands. I'm gonna share with you what I wear. Most of my clothes are actually from Free People Movement and Lulu. I have tried stuff from Old Navy before, and I actually have found that not only is the quality pretty good, but they have some options that aren't like super form fit. So if you are looking for stuff that's a little baggier, maybe a little more cost effective, I would check out Old Navy. Another thing that I always do, and I do this again with like the brands and the styles that I know that I really like, once I have something that I know I love from the store, I'll actually go on Poshmark and I'll see if people are reselling it for cheaper. I know sometimes people aren't really like into the used clothes thing, but a lot of times if you can also find like an influencer, like a fitness influencer who wears things once and then sells it on their Poshmark, that's a really good tip too. Oh my God, I'm sweating already. In terms of shoes, again, I'm just gonna speak from my own experience because I'm not super knowledgeable in this space. In terms of my everyday sneaker, I love Adidas Ultra Boost. And then for lifting, I'm either gonna be barefoot in socks or I do wear Vivo barefoot. Next question, my opinion on fasted workouts for women. All right, first and foremost, I am no expert in this, but I wanna share the knowledge that I've gained over the past few years. Okay, so first and foremost, we have to remember that women with traditional like female sex hormones are just a little more complex. And a lot of the research on anything around fasting has mostly been done on men. And then the studies that we do actually have on women around anything involving fasting, many of them show that fasting is not optimal. That's that's all I'm gonna say, cause again, no expert on it. Personally, I just kind of come to the opinion of like, if you enjoy fasted workouts, go for it. I know that some people don't like having anything in their stomach, uh, some people do. I will say a fasted workout is not going to change anything drastically. So just don't go in thinking that it's like a miracle cure. Can you educate on how to safely do a snatch? I am lifting heavy dumbbells to shoulders, for example, for squats, and I need to learn how to safely snatch and rack the weight. Also doing that related to kettlebells would be great too. Okay, so I think what you mean is actually a clean. So a snatch goes up overhead, a clean comes to the shoulder. I'm gonna overlay a clip of me teaching this in my intro to kettlebells program, but essentially when you're cleaning a kettlebell up to the shoulder, you wanna start with something called a clean catch. So you're essentially going to bring the weight up to the hip, catching underneath of it, driving the elbow back, and then gliding it up onto the shoulder. I would say the main thing to remember here, kettlebell and dumbbell, is to make sure that you're driving the elbow back. If you're racking dumbbells up onto the shoulders, you could also do this, but honestly, I usually just like bring the weight on my thigh as I'm standing and use it to bring it up. So it's personal preference, but those are my recommendations. How does a person plan exercise when they have chronic pain and or a chronic illness? Unfortunately, not only is this out of my scope, I really cannot give any advice here because I have no idea what your situation is. If you are someone with chronic pain or living with a chronic illness that for whatever reason affects your movement, 100% go to your doctor, go to a physical therapist who knows how to deal with whatever you're dealing with, and that's the best advice I have, sorry. Ooh, we're talking about prone leg curl form. Luckily, I have a clip of me doing this at the gym, but essentially you wanna make sure that you are pressing your hip bones down into the pad, and as you're curling, you're not letting it get into your low back. So if you lose that connection with the pad and you start to get any low back movement in, you're going too heavy with the weights and you just need to drop it down. Can a woman build muscle with kettlebells? 100%, so can a man. <laughs> You could build muscle with kettlebells, with dumbbells, with barbells, with bricks, with boxes filled with bricks. You can build muscle with anything that has weight to it. It doesn't matter what the modality is. It matters what you do with it. Do you suggest adding one ab exercises to three times a week lifting sessions along with the rest of the workout or have a separate day that you'll work on the abs alone, maybe with mobility and stability work? Your choice. I also think we need to think about the why here. Like, are you specifically adding in ab exercises? Not like overall core, like ab, like abdominal. <laughs> 
Meaning, for anybody who doesn't know, your rectus abdominis is just one muscle out of your entire core. I don't typically isolate just ab exercises because I'm not super interested in that, I guess. I don't know. Basically, most of the time when people add in just like ab specific exercises, it's because they want to build up their abdominals for visible results. So if that's what you want, I would say you can add it in anywhere. Like if you want to do a whole separate day, you could. I think it's a little much for just one muscle. Also, we have to remember that with abdominals and their visibility, it really does come down to how much body fat you have in that area and that's going to be determined not only by your nutrition, but do your genetics allow you to healthily lose enough body fat from your midsection? So what I do personally is just some type of core exercise in my warm up or maybe in my finisher, and I'm not really using it for abdominal growth. I'm using it to make sure that my core is like fired for the main meat and potatoes part of my lifting. So I think to sum that up, why are you doing ab exercises in the first place? And then you can kind of decide based off of your enjoyment and what your goal is, where you wanna put them in your workout. In a single leg deadlift, which side do you hold the weight on? So you can either hold the weight on the same side, on the working leg, or on the opposite side on the non-working side. If you're holding it on the non-working side, that is called contralateral. And for most people, this is gonna be a little bit easier because now you're balanced between the weight, having weight on one side, and your leg, having weight on the other. If you move the weight to the working leg, it's gonna be a little bit harder for your balance and your core because now all of your weight is on one side. For most people, I start them contralateral, and then if we are really like working on our single leg deadlifts for a while, I'll move it on to the same working side. But if you have a lot of access to weights and you wanna really like like get strong in the movement, I would actually recommend a suitcase hold, which is a weight in both hands and do it that way. Okay, someone is experiencing low back pain on the right side during deadlifts. First and foremost, I would check your form. If your form is immaculate, I would go see a physical therapist. We always have to remember that with any type of pain, that's not normal. So I typically recommend to people first, check your form, make sure that's all spot on. And then if it is, and you're still having pain, well, something deeper is going on. And unfortunately, a person on the internet can't answer that for you. I will say if you some eyes on your form, I'm always happy to check form and exercises if you want to send me a video over. Do you and Kevin train together? Do you coach and make plans for him? <laughs> no. <laughs> Pre-COVID, we did used to like be more into group fitness and we would go do that together. Honestly, I think we just like that as our like own alone time type of thing. He does Orange Theory like one or two times a week for some cardio and then he'll be in our little gym here and he'll do his own strength work. But I did get him to agree to be in a video where I train him. So if you want to see that, let me know. Why does everyone hate CrossFit? Why does nobody get sports specific movements like kipping pull-ups? I get that when you go to the wrong box, you can have shitty coaches that don't take care of you, but isn't that a risk you have regardless of which sport you're trying to pick up? Sure. Okay, CrossFit is all about taking movement patterns and not only performing them as quickly as possible, but also doing it under very heavy load. So we need to remember that first and foremost. I have worked with thousands of people in different group fitness settings, in one-on-one -on -one coaching, and let me tell you this, 90% of people when they first come to me have no idea how to squat, hinge, do a push-up, do a pull-up, do a row, do an overhead press. So. Why would I then throw them into CrossFit where they have to do all of that as quickly as possible under heavy weight? That's why people hate CrossFit. And look, people can do whatever they want, but CrossFit became really, really popular and the it is it has actually is like a big overarching like business. And CrossFit went, well, we want to franchise and we want to get as many boxes out there as possible so we can profit, which makes sense. But when you do that, you start to lose the quality, first of all. So that's where, yes, you can have some like shitty coaches. They do not have like, like an F45 or an Orange Theory, like the same programming across the country. It's like whatever that owner wants to do, which is perfectly fine. But you're also then marketing to general population, which once again, general population doesn't move well. So why are you gonna have them move not well as quickly as possible under a ton of weight? This is where people get injured. Also, I do personally think that a lot of the exercises like the one that you said, Kipping pull-ups are absolutely stupid for general population. I think in CrossFit and any form of movement, there is always a risk of injury, but you have to weigh the risk versus reward. You can't, I mean, you can, but you're gonna get hurt. But <laughs> why would you skip 
the steps where you actually learn how to move better and jump right to CrossFit. So that's my opinion. That's why a lot of coaches really don't approve of it. Also, their whole business is like kind of icky with like what they believe in. I don't know if you guys remember this video where I talked about that graphic that they had put out and it was just all sorts of problematic. And look, this is gonna be a side tangent right here, but I am always someone who likes to, in the fitness industry especially, use my money as a vote for what I wanna see more of. And I will not support businesses like that, that like perpetuate really unhealthy and slightly disordered views of health. And that's just me personally. And a lot of that is because I'm in this industry and, and obviously really believe in it. But you have to remember that like, just because something might get you results, which most of the time with CrossFit, people are like, oh, I lost a lot of weight. And it's like, well, yeah, if you went from doing nothing to doing CrossFit, which is a lot of times what happened when CrossFit really blew up, like, yeah, you're going to lose weight. You're also probably going to throw out your low back. Okay. We're done talking about this because now I'm getting heated. <laughs> I even have notes here and I completely went off script. Let's keep going. What is Metcon? How do you know if you need to do it? So Metcon stands for metabolic conditioning. And the way that most people approach this is basically you're training both your aerobic and your anaerobic system. <sighs> Let's explain. I've explained this in a few videos before. I'm gonna try to make this as succinct as possible because it's actually like kind of boring. So when you go to do something, your body needs to use energy and it typically uses it in the form of ATP. And by typically, I mean it does. <laughs> now, depending on the movement that you're doing, aerobic versus anaerobic, aerobic, your body is going to get ATP from a specific place. Anaerobic activity is something with a short burst of energy. So think like a quick sprint. Think like if you are doing, you know, a set of deadlifts, that's going to be anaerobic because you are using stored ATP versus aerobic training is something that you're doing a lot longer. Think long distance running, think swimming in the pool, think 12, 330 incline walk. That's all going to be aerobic because now your body has to use oxygen to create more ATP. So again, this is basically just a workout that uses both your anaerobic and aerobic systems. Everyone should be training both of these systems throughout their weeks, but this is simply a workout where you can train both at the same time or within the same workout. I would just say, keep in mind that like with HIT, most of the Metcon workouts you see out there are not actually Metcon. It's just aerobic training. Like it's just cardio with weights. It, it all is just kind of like steady state cardio. How long should your workout be? This 100% depends on your goals and your programming. There is no length of time that says this is optimal or this is enough or this is too much. Most of my workouts range from either 30 minutes all the way up to like hour 15, depending on what I'm working on that day. Last one in the fitness chunk. Okay, so I got this message about perimenopause recommendations. I don't know enough about this to give really any recommendations. I do have a fellow coach that I actually just met at a kettlebell class. So I'm gonna leave their info down below. They are definitely much more educated in this field. The one thing that I do know is like, you should still strength train. <laughs> because, and I don't know if this is more perimenopause or more just like menopause proper, but like you do start to lose or decrease your estrogen production, which quite often does result in lowered bone density. This is why like many women as they age do develop osteoporosis. So this is why strength training is always recommended because you're not only going to build, but also preserve the bone density that you have. So aside from that, I have a lot of learning to do. Let's talk about nutrition. What's a good nutrition certification? Precision Nutrition, baby. They are kind of like the gold standard with coaches. I am level one Precision Nutrition certified. I did make a whole video breaking down my experience with Precision, the things that I really liked about it. I have also gone through the NASM nutrition certification and it was really good too. I think that Precision just gives you a lot more coaching tools that are a little bit more actionable. I also no longer really love to support NASM because I think they're turning into like a money grab. I still stand by the fact that I think their intro personal training cert is really good, but everything else is kind of becoming hot garbage. How to eat in a deficit, but still gain muscle. I would say just make sure that you're hitting your protein. And of course that your cut isn't like absolutely insane. I would also ask you like, when you say gain muscle, are you talking like you wanna see more muscle definition or you want to like, bulk up muscle wise. For most people, when they have this goal, they just wanna see muscle definition. They don't really like care about, you know, getting in like a DEXA scan or an in-body or something and actually getting that muscle mass number. I would honestly just say, don't stress about it unless you're competing for something or have like a specific sport that you need this number 
up for. Focus on one thing at a time. I would say if the, the cut is the most important thing to you, stick with that, hit your protein, continue to lift, and don't really stress about the number in terms of muscle mass because you're gonna get a lot of definition as you start to lose that body fat. What's your opinion on the bulk cut cycle thing used in bodybuilding? I see it a lot in the bodybuilding community, but I'm not sure if, that, if it's the healthiest thing. I don't know, I could be talking out of my ass. Me too. <laughs> so first and foremost, what do I think of it? I think it's a really smart way to manipulate how the body looks to get a desired aesthetic outcome. And we need to remember that bodybuilding is, it has nothing to do with health. It has nothing to do with being healthy. I'm not saying that there are not healthy bodybuilders out there, but bodybuilding is part of a competition, right? Where you compete to look a certain way. And that look isn't necessarily the most healthy option for you. It's all about aesthetics and performance. And this is why in so many videos I have said, you are not a bodybuilder, so why would you train and eat like one? Okay, I'm sweating. <laughs> but we're into the final chunk. This is like personal and business questions. So this will be fun. What does the future look like for you when it comes to your fitness career? What's your dream? So in 2020, I, no, in 2021, I wrote down like a five-year plan, which is actually smart and you should do that. So I guess I'm into year three. And without sharing too many specifics, my main goal is really to like be able to survive off of the Fit Club and YouTube and then just have like a handful of private training clients. To clarify, I do actually live off of the Fit Club and YouTube right now, also private clients. The point I'm trying to make is that I would like to have more money <laughs> from all of those things, but less from private clients. You know, a big part of this is that I just really want our time to be our own. We don't want to have to, you know, wait till we're retired to do fun things and have more like spontaneous trips. And we also financially would love to be able to support that. So having like the number of one-on-one -on -one clients that I have now doesn't really support that. But I, I do want to continue to work with people one-on-one -on -one because I think that that really keeps you grounded in like what general population actually needs. I think part of the issue with a lot of these coaches who either A, really blow up and are just producing like mass content or B, have never worked with anybody one-on-one, -on -one, which is a whole separate issue. But I think that they're just really out of tune with like what people want and what people need. So part of that goal is to make sure that I don't lose that. Am I originally from New York City? No, I am from the Philadelphia area. I'm originally from Media, Upper Providence, if you're from the Delco area. And then I went to Temple University in Philly. So I lived in South Philly for a few years. And then Kevin and I moved to Astoria in New York City in 2013. Okay, jumping off the Philly, what are my favorite Philly spots? I haven't lived there for over 10 years. So <laughs> I don't even know if some of these things are open still, but here were like things that I used to do or go to. Also remember that I was a poor college student. So I used to love Morning Glory for breakfast. I don't know if that's still around. I do know this is still there because Kevin and I went recently. Harp and Crown has the coolest like unlimited brunch. Tavern on Broad, may it rest in peace dirtiest underground dive bar. Spent both my 21st birthday and my bachelorette party there at the end of the night. I don't know if it's still around, but there was this really cool Belgian bar, Monks, I think it was. That was pretty cool. And then if you want like touristy recommendations and stuff, I can totally give it to you. Like where's the best cheesesteak, the best pizza, all of that. But I don't know, this is just the stuff I remember doing when I was 22. <laughs> do you plan to do a large gathering like Sydney Cummings does? No. <laughs> I mean, not as of now, to be honest, I just don't think I have nearly enough reach to do anything like that. I feel like four people would show up. I don't know, maybe down the line. And I also would have to make it something where it's like not just a meet and greet, like that feels so weird. And I don't know, I would wanna be like giving something back to you, like whether it's like a class or a workshop or bringing on other people into it to talk about things. Like I, it can't just be about me. That's way too, way too much. Can we get a sneak peek of programming this year? Yes, you can. I have to find it though. So in my online portal, The Fit Club, I release a new, typically a four week program every month. Some of these are gonna be a little different though. So coming up April, which is when you're watching this video, is the four week endurance program. In May, I have a strength for Swifties program coming up which is very exciting. Still waiting on reputation to get released though. Then June, we're doing a four week functional strength 101 program. In July is a power program. August, I'm going to re-release the Broadway Lover program because I just wanted to make some of the videos better. And I'm going to re-release the glute growth program. It's basically gonna be like glute growth 2.0. Again, I know more, my editing is better, my filming is better. I just wanna re-release it. September, we're gonna have a program. I don't really have anything written yet except for build, but I want 
want it to be a little bit more of a strict progressive overload program. And I wanna have a gym option as well, because people have been asking me about that. October, we're gonna put out a second kettlebell program. So it's gonna be a little bit more advanced, more kettlebell skills. November, I'm gonna have two mobility programs coming out. One that's just more like mobility basics and they're little like mobility minis that you can put in throughout your week. So it's not a full strength program, just mobility stuff. And then along with that, we're gonna be releasing an eight week more like flexibility program, which is much more advanced, more in depth. Think like full 30, 40 minute mobility workouts. Yeah. Am I working toward any new skills? I have been working on my sprinting and getting those mechanics down and really building up a lot of speed there for no other reason than I thought it looked like fun. And it is fun. It's, it's more fun for me than like long distance running. And the only other skill I would say that I'm really like actively working on are my snatches, specifically my down snatch. I just have the hardest time getting my elbow back on the way down. I'm just casting out way too much. So I work on that a few times a week. Favorite classes to teach. I love teaching power classes because anytime that I can get people moving with proper form quickly, it's exhilarating. Current favorite song. Let's ask Spotify. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can type in like on repeat and Spotify will ream you for how often you have listened to things. I'm gonna guess it's either Renee Rapp or Taylor Swift because I am a basic white girl. Oh, I was close. <laughs> It is Snow Angel by Renee Rapp. I will also say this has been like my hyper fixation piano song right now. So I've been like listening, trying to hear where everything fits as I'm learning to play it, but it's also just a fire song. What to do after the Back to Basics and Essentials program. So these are programs in the Fit Club. Back to Basics is like kind of intro to basic lifts. Essentials is a little bit more advanced from there. I would either recommend the Move and Mobility program or the stability program. Either one of those I think are a great progression. I would say the stability program is gonna be a little more challenging than the mobility one. What was the catalyst for starting a fitness business? COVID. <laughs> so pre-COVID I worked for three different studios. I did also have my own personal like personal training clients. And then basically like the early months of 2020, I started teaching my core class that I teach now, but like, I rented out my own studio. It was like the core beta class. I charged like a hundred bucks to people for like eight classes, I think. Like they were getting a really good deal. And I remember going to Five Below and getting just a bunch of really cheap yoga mats. And I put them all in this giant suitcase. And every Tuesday for eight weeks, I would get on the subway. This was also my day off. I would get on the subway at night and I would take my giant suitcase of yoga mats and I would teach this class. And I just remember being like, one day you're gonna look back at this and realize how insane this was. And here we are, we're laughing at it. Um, but to be honest, I, I'm I mean, when COVID happened, every studio I worked at shut down. They did eventually move to virtual, but I kind of hopped on it like immediately. I did not think it was just gonna be two weeks. I was trying to plant the seeds of like building my own thing, whatever that meant. And I was like, let's just do it. So I started teaching like a class a week and then I started teaching two classes a week and then three and then four and then five and then built the fit club. And I think it's obviously an unfortunate situation, obviously that, pushed me into it, but I'm very grateful for the silver lining and that I do get to work for myself. I will also say I got super lucky that I already had a YouTube page, not for the subscribers. I don't even think I had a thousand subscribers yet. More so for the fact that I had so much practice time talking to a camera and using technology like this. And I think that that's what really set me apart in the beginning was because I just had a little bit more of a natural sense doing this. Thoughts on crumble cookies, never had them. I don't know if we have them in New York, but I do love Chip City. Where do we keep the gym equipment? Oh, we were blessed to stumble upon this apartment in 2020 and it is a four bedroom, my friend. We do not need four bedrooms and we use them, but we don't need four bedrooms for people. So we have our bedroom. We obviously have this studio space. Kevin has an office in the back next to the bedroom. And then next door to this is a very small room where we basically have a gym. So we keep all of the equipment in there, not only so I have a cleaner filming space, but also just so like Kevin can use it too and he doesn't have to come in here. I will say our mothers were both very upset that we did not make it a guest bedroom, but Hmm. How many certs do you have? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, we'll just count the active ones. NASM CPT, Precision Nutrition Level 1. Looking at my certs on the wall. FRC, CFSC Level 1, and Pronatal. 
five. Again, I've gotten other things, like I talked about the NASM nutrition one, but that's expired and I haven't renewed it. My goal at the end of this year is to start at least start studying for CSCS, which is like a very, very, very respected personal training cert. Not many women have it and it's really hard. I think there's like a 40% pass rate on your first try, but I want it. I really want it. Do I ever doubt myself? Absolutely. I feel like everyone gets imposter syndrome. And I think especially with social media, it's really hard seeing like the success of others and maybe feeling like you should be more successful. I think what really helps me is like going back to my why because you're, your why and your message and your style and everything, you're gonna have overlap with other coaches and creators, but you have to always remember that there is something very unique and special to you that you bring to the table and your approach to things. So just keep focusing on like staying true to that and what you offer and why it's so special. What do you like about Astoria and can you see yourself elsewhere? I love our neighborhood. It's walkable. It's a super easy commute into Manhattan, like on the N or the W or even the R, it's like, maybe 10 minutes. Not that I fly a lot, but we are literally five minutes from LaGuardia. We have amazing food here. It's very Greek neighborhood historically. We also have a whole chunk um, down the street that's very like little Egypt. So between those two like styles of food, it's really, really culturally rich. I will also say the Greeks, they are loyal and they do not sell their property, which we love here because we have not been fully priced out. We have not become Williamsburg. <laughs> it's also just a neighborhood where it's like, it's big enough to walk around and be anonymous, but also small enough where you can see people you know, which for me is just like the best of both worlds. It's also very community driven. There's a lot of like social programs in the neighborhood, which is just really, really awesome. In terms of staying here or moving somewhere else, honestly, as long as Kevin is doing stand up, we're gonna be here. We might move somewhere else eventually, we don't really know. My number one rule is that I have to live in a neighborhood that's walkable, but it's not like I'm the crazy lady who walks everywhere, right? Like we don't want that. <laughs> and that's really hard to find in the US, which is really sad. So I don't know. Last question. Woo, good, because I feel like this video is an hour. Why did you quit pursuing theater? This, <laughs> this deserves a way longer video. Um, but I'll give you like the, the Cliff Notes version. So I went to school for theater. Kevin and I moved to New York in 2013. Comedy, theater. From my time like in Philly performing professionally and then when I stopped performing in 2018, I had like 10 years of, you know, regional theaters and some touring work. And to be honest, I just didn't enjoy the whole process anymore, especially like the audition process. I was pretty uninspired, like with a lot of my auditions, I was just losing steam. And I, th I really think a huge part of that is the fact that my side hustle was working in fitness and I was really good at it. And because I was really good at it and it was a normal career path, well, nor more, more normal than theater, I saw a lot of upward trajectory in my career. Like, oh, I led really, really good classes. So I got a raise and a promotion and more classes and more education. And like that linear trajectory really felt good. And I hadn't had that in my whole adult life because theater is so up and down. And it just got to the point where I was like, I think I want to do this instead. But also fun fact, I originally went to school for physical therapy before I took a year off and then transferred to Temple for theater. So if anything, I think I've come full circle. This is, this is why it needs a longer video. <laughs> Okay, we are sweating and we're done. I tried to get to as many questions as possible. I know that I posted this prompt really late because I actually forgot I was filming this today. So if I didn't get to your question this time, hopefully I can get to it next time. If there's anything else that you would like me to answer or even expand upon in a longer form video, please let me know down in the comments. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out and I will see you all in the next one.